Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? I learned that from the Nancy Drew detective. Okay, go. You think you can follow the clues and solve the case of the missing condiment, Nancy Drew? Yeah. Because I've read every Nancy Drew mystery ever written. Nancy, please tell me you're joking. Wow, you suck at this Nancy Drew stuff. You should get a new hobby. My name is Carson Drew, and this is my assistant, Nancy. 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 Nancy Drew. It's curtains for you, Miss Drew. regular Nancy Drew. Okay, hello, regular Drews. Hi, everyone. We are so excited today <laughs> um, because we get to talk to someone very, very special to us, very important to the Nancy Drew community, the lovely, amazing, talented Jen Fisher. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Jen is a self-proclaimed Nancy Drew historian, an author, the president and founder of the Nancy Drew Sleuths fan club, the creator of nancydrewsleuth.com, among many other <laughs> websites that I know that you own, um, an avid collector, and just an all-around Nancy Drew guru. Um, she has consulted on multiple Nancy Drew adaptations, has published numerous articles and op-eds about Nancy, and is currently working on a biography of Mildred Wirt Benson the original ghostwriter of the Nancy Drew mystery story. So yes, so we are so excited to have you, Jen. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Is there anything that we didn't say about you that you want to mention to our listeners or anything that you're working on or anything like that? No, I think you covered it really good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> So the first question that we ask pretty much everybody who comes on the podcast um, is, what is your Nancy Drew story? And by that, we mean, how did you first learn about Nancy Drew and how were you first introduced to Nancy Drew? So I believe I was introduced through some friends and the school librarian. Uh, we had a big set of them at the school library, and I have really fond memories of going to the library. And uh, we, we'd have programs in this big open space and around that space was shelving on three sides. And I would always sit by the Nancy Drew books <laughs> that were in that space. And I was always probably peeking at them instead of, you know, doing what I was supposed to be doing or watching or <laughs> listening to what I was supposed to be doing. But sure. Nancy always held my attention. In fact, I have an old school paper stored somewhere where it lists, like you had to list, this was an elementary school, you had to list your favorite book or author. And of course I put down Nancy Drew and Carolyn Keene. So Aww. I would just, I always loved these books as a kid. And I think it was because I loved mysteries and I was so curious. I was an only child. Yeah. So you kind of had to make your own adventures and, you know, you didn't have siblings to play with and you had to sort of, I was kind of independent like Nancy. And I think I just loved getting down to the bottom of a mystery or, and, and, you know, all that sort of suspense. And that's sort of what attracted me to Nancy Drew. Wow. That is yeah, so that's cool. so special. Yeah. So you are the president and the founder of the Nancy Drew Sluice fan club. Is that right? Yes. So can you tell us um, a little bit about what made you want to start the group and how that, how that came about originally? So around 1997-ish, kind of, there was a lot of people were getting on the internet back then. That's a while ago, but uh, it seems like forever ago because we, you know, we had dial-up back then. You guys didn't have to experience that. Oh yeah, yeah, we <laughs> oh, did. did you? Yes, we did. did. Okay, okay. I promise well, we're that... not we're not that oh, young. Oh, okay. You seem so young. <laughs> um, so I had a friend that also read them when we were kids, and she told me about this message board online. Um, it was set up by Applewood Books that was doing the reprints of the Nancy Drew books, and they had like a message board, one of those old rudimentary original style message boards on the internet. Um, and there were other collectors on there and I sort of, you know, I got onto the message board and started, you know, reading the messages and kind of interacting with people. And, and there was another kind of Nancy Drew forum. It was a little different. It was kind of like a listserv. Um, but there was all these squabbling collectors there like that would fight with each other. It's mostly <laughs> oh, the wow. men that were the problem, but oh. they were always bickering <laughs> at each other. And it wasn't just about Nancy Drew, it was about all sorts of different series and it was crazy. But um, a friend that I had met that had been in the collecting world longer than myself, 
um, kind of sort of, you know, showed me the ropes and introduced me to people and told me different things and helped me get started. Cause you know, I had my childhood books, but I didn't have all these books going back to the thirties. And so I kind of, she kind of helped get me into the collecting, told me about eBay, which I hadn't heard about. And, um, because of all that squabbling at this old <laughs> board and the gossipy stuff, you wouldn't believe it. It was ridiculous. It was like a soap opera. Spill the tea, Jen. Oh, I know. <laughs> Tell us. And, oh, gosh. Oh, it would be a, quite the novel. But, like, there was a, someone in our group that would say, you know, it was like a train wreck. He just he would get home from work just to go see what was going on. Um, but, anyhow, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> but anyhow, this other lady and I said, you know, this is kind of a toxic environment. We didn't use that word. It's such a word people use now, but it really was a toxic mm-hmm. environment. So we started, um, uh, over at the former e-groups, then it was Yahoo groups and nobody really, I guess it's been disbanded now, but we started an email list serve call, and we called it Nancy Drew Sleuths. And it was to have a discussion forum where people weren't fighting and acting crazy other than the normal, you know squabbles over like hair color and other issues about Nancy Drew, <laughs> the silly ones. But um, yeah, so we could create a more like a safe space or whatever for people to just have fun and meet up and not have all this drama. And so we called ourselves Nancy Drew Sleuths. And uh, this was like the year 2000 um, when we sort of created this. Uh, and it just started out as a discussion group. You know, we were just meeting up, talking about the books, um, maybe selling or trading among other collectors, just fun stuff like that. And uh, then it just kind of snowballed over the years into what we are now. Wow. What an amazing origin story. (laughs) Who would have thought it would, that's the reason it started. Yeah. I mean, the next, the next year we went to, we kind of had what we call our first unofficial convention, which was 2001. And we went to Toledo to meet the original ghostwriter who died a year after that, just about, um, you know, she was like 95. And so we had a local member in Toledo that said, you really ought to come meet her. You know, he had been to meet her and had some books signed by her and was telling me about it. And I was like, well, maybe one day. And he's like, no, she's 95. And then it kind of <laughs> pointed my brain. And I was like, you know, maybe we sh- this is a great opportunity to meet her because, you know, I, I, I discovered the originals by then. And I loved the original stories that she wrote. Uh, the writing was so good. And so my mom and I did this road trip where we drove from Texas back to Toledo we book hunted all along. We like book hunted all day and drove in, in, in the evenings into the next stop. And we would like book hunt the whole way. But we got to Toledo, we met Millie and it was just, it was so much fun to meet her. And I was going to write an article for a series zine about um, meeting her and us being there. So there was mm-hmm. like 12 of us that, that met up there. Anyhow, long, short story long. Um, <laughs> we, we got there, I met her and she was going to write an article about our group's visit for the paper, which she did uh, for her column. And, um, she was asking me information about like our group and what, what did we do and how to, you know, how are we set up? And I was explaining it, you know, I'm the moderator of this group. She wasn't really on the internet or anything like that. So she, it was kind of like, I don't know if it was necessarily confusing to her, but she just didn't quite wrap her head around like my name and why am I called just a moderator? She said, no, I'm going to make you the president of this group. (laughs) And I was like, no, 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 wait a minute. (laughs) It's just a discussion (laughs) group. What are you doing? And so it just, everybody's like, oh yeah, you can be the president. And so that's how all of that happened. And then everybody wanted to keep getting together every year. So we kind of became this organization that puts on conventions and I would plan them and you know I just sort of like I said snowballed from there but that's kind of how we I ended up being the president of this group. that is so special yeah you were like bequeath the title of president yeah. from yeah. from you Millie. know yeah because yeah. uh, otherwise from I, the OG I, herself yeah I don't know if she hadn't done that if I would have ever you know we just would have been an organization of people doing stuff and I don't know that I would have ever thought to call myself president of the group or anything like that so yeah that's how that happened well we're so glad she did yeah Yeah. wonderful (laughs) so lovely thank you so what else do you do I mean we know that you organize the convention but what else do you do in your capacity as president well so I also deal with companies that license Nancy Drew sometimes that they want to reach out and either talk to people in the group like the people that did the um you know the what is it called? Um, those little murder kits that you do. Um, oh, yeah, okay. the, yeah. The Magnolia one. Um, 
they wanted oh like, you consulted on that they wanted a test group um oh, so okay. I, awesome. I reached out to the discussion group and then had people that were interested in testing it out uh, the hunt to killer game people um yeah and so, i love yeah so a bunch of people on the the group got into little groups at that time and tested the game for them so sometimes cool. they'll reach out like that sometimes they'll just want to ask me questions um you know find out information that they don't really know mm-hmm. or get interesting trivia or history behind this or that and sure ask like what cover art should we go for you know which era should we do for this and sometimes I'll get to consult so I do stuff like that um I do the merchandising I deal with Simon and Schuster on that and you know we have our shop at the website um we have a, a like a little magazine called the sleuth uh, which we do special editions now. We're working on the next one right now. Um, we just publish them every so often. Um, so I do that. And then what else do I do? Let's see. What else do I do? <laughs> I know. Yeah, so we, you I, do so much. It's like, well, <laughs> got to make sure you hit everything. <laughs> yeah. And then we do our library donations. Um, you know, right. we try to do that every year when we're doing a convention. Um, and so we do stuff like that. And so, yeah, that's kind of what I do. I manage the membership and the merchandising, the conventions, the zine. I help with that. Yeah, so I, I have a full plate with all of that. And then um, then I try to my own projects of writing or research and the book that I'm working on. So all of that, too. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how that book's going? So the book is going... You no pressure. I know, I know that it can be, it can be a t- tough topic. Oh, I know. I've been working <laughs> on it for years and, um, it's going good. I'm still going through a lot of research though. I, I came into a lot of research from the family, a lot of letters that she wrote to her daughter and other interesting mm-hmm. things. And it's so info dense that it's just like, and some mm-hmm. of, some of it's handwritten and some of it's, her writing could be neat or it could be a crazy mess. So trying to decipher some of the letters has been like slow going. Um, but yeah, so I'm going through a lot of that still. I'm organizing it, um, working on different areas. And then, you know, what's funny with the research is I will discover something interesting and then I'm going down a rabbit hole, finding more, you know, doing more research and finding more stuff to fill in that little gap. And so it's like, I've just gone in all these little rabbit holes as I'm gathering all these puzzle pieces to put this together, but I'm hoping to get it done uh, this year finally. And so that's my goal is to get it done this year before the anniversary next year. Yeah. So we'll see um, how that goes, but it's like, I get distracted with the conventions or I get distracted with this and then I come back to it and it goes back and forth and so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I started researching this theoretically back when we went to Toledo, but I did it like off and on. I would gather research when I'd get to go to New York for a particular reason. And I get to go to the library there and get into the Stratemeyer archives and I'd get a little bit done. And then, you know, I'd find another way to get back to the archives here and there. So I've just gathered stuff over the years to where, but there's a little bit more I'm still seeking. And I don't know if I'll ever get to that particular thing. Um, that I need for this. And I may just have to just give up on that dream of getting that particular Mm. research kind of being hoarded by somebody. Um, Oh, uh, yeah. So it's a little frustrating. Um, And if that never pans out, then I'll just have to write it as is. But there's some things that that particular research could maybe really answer better. So anyhow, but I'm excited. I'm hoping to get it done. So that's where I'm at. Well, I hope you can find it because I'm I'm ready to read it. That sounds so oh, cool. I know. Yeah, I know. Now I now I'm really excited. I really want to get to it. Yeah, there's some really <laughs> neat things about her life and things that she's done that have never really been written about before. Nobody really knows. So, um, some of her adventures down in South America. Yeah. Some of her early reporting, you know, days as a reporter in the '40s. There's right. just so many little things yeah. I've I've delved into. So. Wow, that's so that's impressive so how you've done all this. Oh, thank you. And then, of course, there's the, um, you know, what I talked about in Salem, the ghost business. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You know, whether she's haunting her former Toledo Dimes building and all of that. So that's kind of, I don't know, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. If you all want to hear more about that, you should uh, go back and take a listen to our episode that we actually made about the convention in Salem. We talk a little bit about uh, your talk, Jen, and um, you mentioning, yeah, Millie potentially haunting <laughs> her uh, prior workplace. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting how both she and Harriet Adams are considered to be haunting 
uh, places now. And it's kind of unusual. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's something there's something in there. There's something philosophical in there about these women who have had such, you know, a landmark impact on, you know, all of us all through the years here. They're, they're somehow still lingering, maybe spiritually, but maybe also just, you know, through all of us, too. Yeah, yeah. it's very cool. It is. Well, speaking of the conventions, um, I know next year you're planning one for Sleepy Hollow. Is that right? Yes. So we'll be in Sleepy Hollow and we're going to have several things going on. Um, we're going to combine the Haunted Bridge, the classic book number okay. 15, with the Sleepy Hollow to kind of weave an interesting story. And I have kind of, I had a Halloween party a few years ago where I mixed the two. And I wrote this little one page kind of story, just glossing over how they would be interwoven together. We're going to expand on that a little bit for this convention. So that'll be Ooh, fun. Uh... And then um, the Flying Saucer Mystery, the Mountain Range that I guess where the book was actually set, the Shawan, I'm not going to pronounce this right, Shawan Gunk, or they call it the Gunks. <laughs> um, it's about an hour north of Sleepy Hollow. Oh, okay. And it's a mountain range or called the Shawan Gunk Ridge. Um, and it's near like Gardner, New York, and New Paltz, New York. Anyhow, uh, so the Flying Saucer was, in the book, it was called Shawnee Gunk Mountain. Mm. Okay. But it's actually gotcha. the Shawan Gunk. Yeah. So we can actually go to the area where this book is supposed to be set. So I thought it would be fun to just make a day trip ah. where we kind of do a flying saucer mystery activity and bring in that book. <laughs> and then there's a book that Millie wrote uh, in her Penny Parker series called Hoofbeats, Hoofbeats on the Turnpike. <gasps> That's cool. And it's basically using the Sleepy, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow as kind of a backdrop. Um, and a lot of the things from that story kind of come into play in this particular book. Mm. So I thought it would be kind of fun to bring a Millie book into it. Absolutely. Okay. And then, yeah. And then of course, warnings at Waverly Academy. We love yep. that one. Um, <laughs> we love that. One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the book that it's loosely based on, I guess the black cat, mm -hmm. the curse of the black cat or black cat curse. Um, we'll bring into that as well. And the Dana girls series, because the Dana girls were at a boarding school also written by Carolyn Keene. Right. So I thought for the meet and greet, we would combine all of that and have some fun uh, bringing that all to life. So yeah, we got a lot going on. For sure. <laughs> it's fun to kind of bring in the themes, you know, and figure out how to have us, you know, bring those things to life and what we end up doing. So yeah, and we'll probably have a convention day as we usually do with some speakers and some special guests. And so we're working on that. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. That's very exciting. Sounds like the planning's very involved. It is. Yeah. It, it's, it starts early with just picking the dates, finding the hotel, and then getting the theme and the sort of like a foundation for how we're going to set out each day. So right now I'm just waiting on the contract from the hotel so I can let everybody know uh, where they can book. And um, it's a, it, it, it's about to be ready. Nice. So it should be any time. And then I'm working on the registration part, which you have to kind of figure out early what the fee is going to be that covers all these activities mm -hmm. and all the stuff we do. So I'm working on that right now too. And that should be wrapped up pretty soon. Yeah, we are, uh, we are trying our best to try to make it to this one too, because we had such a great time at Salem. Mm -hmm. So that was yeah, very I'm so exciting glad you guys had fun. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I hope you're able to make it. Um, I did discover there's an airport really close by in White Plains. Oh, okay. nice. Um, so you don't actually even have to fly into any of the New York area oh, airports okay. or New Jersey and Newark. It's way you easier. Actually, if you're able to from wherever you're from, like I can fly from here to North Carolina and then into White Plains. And it's like 12 miles from where the hotel would be. Wow. So it's very wow. close. Yeah. Perfect. So the logistically getting there it doesn't look as crazy as it seemed like it might be for some people okay. so i'm glad about to hear about that so, good yeah because yeah, we were looking at flights <laughs> we were like well maybe we could we could fly into new york and then spend some days in new york before we go mm -hmm. <laughs> so we were trying to figure yeah, that out I bet, I bet some people do that just to check out new york city because mm -hmm. i think you can probably get a train or something yeah. up towards Terrytown um for those that want to do it that way yeah very cool so is there a favorite convention or a favorite anything that you have done specifically with Nancy Drew Sleuth? There has been several favorites. It's almost hard to pick, you know, because every year I was like, I try to top the, the previous year. <laughs> and <laughs> But I've had so many good ones. I mean, the first one where we met right. Millie will probably always be a really fond memory. Um, that was really neat. 
Um, I've liked the two that we did in New Orleans just because mm. I absolutely love going to New Orleans. I mm. love everything about it. So we've had so much fun in Louisiana. Um, San Diego, we had for the first time, we had Pamela Sue Martin and Parker <gasps> Stevenson from the 70s TV shows and the producers. That's so cool. <laughs> and yeah, so that was a really neat convention, just getting to see all of them and talk to them and have them, you know, come to our events and stuff. So that was a really fun one that we did in San Diego. Um, but I mean, I have so many favorites. When we did Maine several years ago, Maine is just gorgeous. Mm. And, you know, we went back there during the Salem Convention for the day. But Ogunquit was just so cute. It's just a really quaint town. And I was just bringing that book to life. You know, it was, it was like the actual place where it was set. It was, everything fit. And so that was really cool. I think just the following in Nancy's footsteps part. But also, this past year, when we went to Cooperstown, for me, that was so much fun just because of the research that I did behind the scenes where I uncovered why Harriet Adams even went to Cooperstown to you know, research for this book, why she wrote the book, and that family connection that went back all the way to the 1920s wow. and all the other stuff I uncovered through my research was so fun just to get the backstory and the history behind it. It wasn't always one of my favorite books growing up. It had such a Scooby Doo quality, and I love Scooby Doo. Yeah. <laughs> but and I, I, you know, I enjoyed it, but it was never always one that I considered a favorite. But it's higher on my list now, having gone through and done all that research and figured out the secret of why Harriet went there and all that sort of mysterious stuff. And then I got to speak to you know Grace Grote, who was an employee of the syndicate that was still alive. You know, she's one hundred and two and a half. Wow. She's just turned one hundred and three this past December. Wow, uh, that's amazing. And I got to speak to her on the phone. I know it was so much fun to talk to her uh, about her days at the syndicate, and you know, she was there at the time. You know, Mirror Bay was being written. So, so just those fun little things to make something kind of special, you know, looking back at it. But there's just been so many fun ones. Key West, I could go on and on. <laughs> Key West was fabulous. Oh, yeah. We had a very tiny crowd there, um, but we had so much fun together. Um, just the sailing, we went out to the Ooh. dry tortugas and um, snorkels. Oh, so cool. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was so much fun. So, I had a great time in Key West. I would go back anytime. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Wow. Well. Yeah, it was, it was fun. So you are really well known for what a fantastic Nancy Drew collector you are. Um, we would love to know how your collecting journey began and, and why collecting, you know, why did, why did you go from just a fan to avid collector? Well, I guess, you know, like everybody, I was a fan. I grew up reading them and, you know, most of us, we might hang on to our childhood books. I did. I never got rid of my Nancy Drews. I never had a full set though. Um, cause I read a lot of them from the library and then my mom would buy books for me when we go to the bookstores and I probably had more of the modern mm. stuff from bookstores and the classics. I was hit and miss. I had some of the yellow spines and then like a twin thriller that I got found at a bookstore once. Um, it was bungalow and lilac and twin thriller book club edition. And I was always confused by that book cause it was obviously different from the matte yellow spine. But I didn't understand that it was a book club because it doesn't say anything about that on it. So I never quite understood what that was. I thought, well, this must be a more vintage version, but I didn't know. But I was curious, but not enough to like, and you didn't really have a way at that time. I didn't have a way to do any research on any of this, really. It wasn't until um, I kind of got on the internet and met all these other collectors that it opened up this whole world of Nancy Drew. And then I found this staircase book in, a, in an antique mall in the blue with the orange silhouette mm. on it from the thirties. And I, it didn't look like the story I had read as a kid, which I read pretty much all the revised versions. So, um, that was intriguing and confusing at the same time, <laughs> but I was like, what is this? And then I, you know, got on the internet, met collectors and discovered, you know, these books went back to 1930. And I was so intrigued because nothing I had read ever had a copyright date back that far. It was like, 59 mm -hmm. onward and, you know, revised versions of the first 34. So, um, yeah, I think that just, I, I was like, I've got to get it all, <laughs> you know, I've got to get all this, all these historical ones and vintage ones. And then I started hearing about the history behind it, which made it so much more interesting to me. So then I wanted to kind of, I went down that rabbit hole of, okay, I'm going to have all these different formats. I have to have the original versions and the revised versions that I'm missing 
you know, it was like fill in what I'm missing. And then it became, okay, I'm going to collect first printings of each of the books. So then I kind of went into that and then it was collect anything Nancy <laughs> Drew. Related. So anything and everything Nancy Drew. And then at some point, I think because of my interest in the history behind it all and getting to visit the New York Public Library, which I did on our third convention in 2003, it was my first visit there, seeing the archive, seeing all the papers and the interesting things behind the scenes as they're working on all these books and special things and, you know, branding and licensing, just seeing all that background material really interested in me and the behind the scenes part of it. So then I started focusing on all this ephemera, like letters to Carolyn Keene that show up every once in a while on eBay. Somebody's selling a fan letter they received from Carolyn Keene or her secretary or something <laughs> interesting or advertising behind like the twin thriller book club. So there's all the the forms you could fill out to send in or the little mailer that you would get in the mail that we'd fill out to send in for it. And all these different little ephemera pieces that sort of tell the story of how it was advertised. And then how, you know, what it looked like when they were advertising it, and then the actual book itself. So just telling the story with all that information, I began collecting all the advertising and all the little mailers wow. and just anything and everything behind the scenes related to it. So that kind of changed my focus, I think. I mean, I, I wanted the books to read. I read them numerous times, all the originals that I had never read before. And I loved all the art. So I was collecting all the different art editions of the books. And then, you know, then I, of course, I had to have more library editions because I love library editions. I, I had to have foreign editions. I collected a lot of those. <laughs> And it just snowballed to every, yeah. anything and everything to the point where I was sort of collecting to tell that story and knowing that what I really want to do with this is um, I want it to be somewhere where people can learn from it and it will have a useful purpose rather than just sitting in my home. It was great in my home. I love seeing it. But then at one point I had to put curtains all over the shelves because of so many windows being in this mm. room where it was housed. Right. Some things, especially modern things, the inks were fading. The vintage, not so much, but paperbacks and anything really modern would fade a little. So I put these cartons up, then they couldn't see it. I'd take them off if people were visiting or, you know, or having some event or something. But, you know, and then it was just sitting there and then it kind of outgrew the shelves and stuff was in boxes and containers. And it just, it kind of became, there was so much and it became a little out of control in some ways for my space and what I could do with it. So I think, you know, at one point before it got to that point, I had, you know, I'd asked the, the library in Toledo about, would you want this collection someday? Oh yeah, we'd love it. And then, you know, what happened? I'm sure you're probably going to ask me about that. You know, how did I end up getting this collection to Toledo? So, what was the next question? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so 2019, um, in the spring, I hear from the library and they had started undergoing a major renovation the previous fall of the downtown library. So they were, I mean, it was closed and they were renovating like crazy. And it was like a multi-million dollar renovation, uh, really big deal for Toledo. And so they said, you know, we can carve a space out for your collection oh. while we're renovating and doing all of this. So it would be a really good time to donate. And of course, you know, I was a little hesitant for just a little bit, because I just, right. I didn't expect that. Right. I thought I'd be in my 80s or something <laughs> sure. when this collection gets donated, you know, and I was in my 40s. So, um, and I hadn't collected everything. I mean, there's some stuff out there. I still don't have some more rare or scarce items, but, um, you know, but I decided I it would be because I felt a little overwhelmed with so much stuff here and not a really great way to archive it like properly. Um, it was a little bit of a relief, I guess, in some ways to put it there where it could be treated better, elevated a bit, archived better and displayed, you know, for everybody to see and learn from and research from and all that fun stuff. And maybe inspire kids that come in and see it to pick up the books because, you know, they put the books on top of some of the cases mm -hmm. that they have in circulation. So the kids can reach up and grab Aww. their, not my books, but the library's right. books that they have in their circulation. Like it kind of, it, there's a little sign there, you know, check out one of these and that's so, cool. so and then we have yeah so that's what I love about it is the kids can look at all that and then want to read the books and then reach up and grab a book mm -hmm. yeah off of some of those display cases where they have them and so anyhow that's kind of how that happened except 
you know, I boxed it up. I shipped it. So by December of 2019, it was there. I went there and kind of helped with some of the initial setup. They had done like a preview with some of my stuff in the September before that, when the whole library renovation was done and they had a grand opening for the public. So we had a few things in the cases and stuff just for that night. The rest of it made it there by December. I went and then we kind of fixed up more of the cases with more things and, you know, did stuff like that. And CBS was there and they did a little interview about everything. And so that was fun. Yeah. But then the pandemic happened because <laughs> right. we had planned to have like a big Nancy Drew party that following summer of 2020. Mm-hmm. And as right. you know, that all got dashed, but 22, 2022, we finally had that sort of grand opening a couple years later um, in July of that year. And everybody got to go and have a really good time and sort of support the collection and get to see everything, which was really cool. That is so special. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of happened. And then the pandemic delayed some things. We've got to get it digitized um, so that people that can't necessarily get to Toledo or want to use it for some research online will be able to access things. Wonderful. In it. Especially some of the research. Yeah. Some of the research items, the ephemera, mm-hmm. yeah. which would be good for research could be digitized. And so that's something that I think is the next, hopefully the next phase of what they'll get back to doing is getting that done and some sort of website set up to sort of showcase what's there and, you know, make like an archival listing of what is in there, like a finding aid, I guess you would call it. Um, sort of people know what's there and, you know, people can request items to be seen and then they'll take it to the rare book room that they have there that has more of the Millie and Nancy Drew stuff in it. Um, and then they can view it in there, the little specialized conditions in there. They want to see something in person or do some research. They can do that and they'll have a finding aid. So they'll know what's there and what they can request. And so that's kind of probably the next phase to get to with that. That'll be coming. So that'll be really nice once all that's done. That is so cool. That is so amazing. I mean, just to think about like how, like for you, it was just kind of like this snowball effect of, you know, Mm -hmm. really just kind of coming into collecting and then just realizing how much more, how much of a greater legacy there was with all of these, you know, all the history of Nancy Drew to eventually get to the point where you contributed to just to to all of this legacy in such a grand way by providing all of these you know all of this collection to the public that's just such a special story and to think about how like little kids today get to see all that and experience that and then get to pick the books and to read them and take them off the shelf that's just mad that's just pure magic how special that we have something that's very sweet Yeah. yeah given a new new life to all these wonderful, unique items that you've collected. And now they get to live on and introduce new people to Nancy Drew. That's so wonderful and special. And how, how could you do better for your collection, right? What, are the, what better way to use it? I know. I mean, there's. I've had some conversations with some people since donating it. And, you know, they. it is true. It's probably not something everybody could do. I mean, there's not that many places that would take a collection and actually display a bunch mm-hmm. of it. Um, out on display there's you know there's archives in places there's universities that have series book related collections but they all sit back in an archive they're not displayed Mm -hmm. and so my my dream was to always have it where it was at least a bunch of it would be on display as much as possible and I think that's why I reached out to Toledo originally because we had had some events there at the library related to Millie Uh, we had an event after she passed away like a memorial event and that local collector Rick um, Sayers he had a display of a lot of his Millie books and Nancy Drew items at one point. And so we'd done stuff at the library and I had noticed in the the children's section is just outside of the Nancy Drew part is phenomenal. They have original children's book artwork all over. They have a gallery of that. They have all these interactive elements. They have a boat, a car, kids can get in uh, an aquarium and little interactive things. Dr. Seuss, cute little figures and this, this little room, you can go under these low doors and get into these little areas. It's just so cool and interactive. They have a giant light, bright display. They have little things on the floor. You can step on that do stuff. I mean, I've never seen a children's library like that. It's just phenomenal. And it's this gorgeous old library that has just beautiful architecture. So it was a beautiful place. And I had noticed, of course, <laughs> they had this little auditorium at one time or this little room that they would do events in in the children's area. And it's no longer like for that. It's, it has other uses now that they've renovated. But 
along the wall leading to that. And I was like, nothing along a quite a big expanse of this one area. And I thought, they could put shelves there <laughs> and my collection could go there possibly, you know, that would actually be a space for it. And of course it ended up being in this really neat old room that used to be an office and a storage area um, back in the day. So it has all the original wood paneling yeah. and vintage, Beautiful. you know, fixtures and things. So it looks really cool to, with the collection, but that's kind of what started me is I wanted a place for it to be displayed. So it would have some use. I didn't want it sitting anywhere. And I wanted people to learn about all these neat things that I had uncovered through my research and collecting. So I, I was, I guess, like you said, I was wanting to find a use for it and a purpose and give it a new life because it had a great life here, just me enjoying it. But and if people came to visit, they could enjoy it. But that was limited. I mean, the whole world couldn't see it that easily. They couldn't. It wasn't as tangible here at my house. So, you know, when we designed it in the room, there was this one area of cases where, like, waist down for, like, an adult, anyhow, they have these pull-out drawers. I wanted these pull-out drawers for all the little trinkets and little fun tiny collectibles or little some paper things. So there's all these little pull-out drawers that have themes to them, like book club editions. So there's memorabilia from those or like jewelry mm -hmm. and fan-created crafts in another little drawer. So the kids can pull out all these little drawers and they have like a glass covering so you can't get into it. But they can look in and you know find all these little treasures wow. in there. That's so that's neat. kind of fun, at least. Yeah. So I love those drawers. That's one of my favorite things, um, among other favorites. But the Tandy painting that they have of Shadow Ranch got to be hung in there. And of course, that's the closest I would ever come to affording a Tandy <laughs> painting. I mean, those are very expensive and very scarce. Mm -hmm. um, and then Mike, the collector from Florida, Mike Gowitz, he has been lending some of his original paintings for them to display kind of also with the collection and stuff. And wow. he's got a couple of Tandy paintings. So I think the uh, Secret in the Old Attic will be the next one to go up there if it hasn't made it wow. already. I'm not sure when that gets sent, but they're rotating those out. So that's pretty fun. Isn't the nappy there too? Um, they had, um, well, they had a nappy just during my thing at uh, Jim McNamara. He, he lent some of his artwork just for display during the event. Um, they'll eventually get my nappies, my um, witch tree symbol, which actually wow. I'll show you guys. There it is up <gasps> oh, on the wall wow. up there. Well, a little witch tree I symbol. Love it. One of my, it was a, it was a favorite. I think yeah. the, I was a Halloween fan, so I loved anything mm -hmm. witchy. But um, my hidden staircase from Nappy, the third art where she's got the, you know, going up the staircase with the mm -hmm. flashlight. Um, they'll eventually have that. And so they'll eventually have some nappies and you never know a collector that has nappies might do donate or, you know, work out an arrangement to have those there permanently at some mm -hmm. point. That's kind of what I'm hoping with this donation too, is, you know, I'm still collecting for mm -hmm. it, um, because there wasn't totally complete. I had pretty much most of the books. Um, but there was foreign editions I didn't have yet library editions I didn't have yet. Um, and just a couple here and there. And I filled in some of that since donating it. Um, and I keep looking for that. But there's like stuff like the um, puzzle in a canister. Um, okay. This 170s TV show t-shirt. We still have not found an actual example <laughs> of. But we know it exists. Um, there's little rare things like that. Scarce, scarce things, mm -hmm. I guess you could say. Um, that I'm still looking for. So I'm still actively collecting for it. Um, but that's also like a great opportunity for other collectors who have something that I don't have in the collection. They don't really want duplicates, but if I don't have it and someone wants to donate something um, for their collection, so like if somebody wanted to donate the puzzle in the canister or the 70s TV show watch in its original packaging and all complete, like I don't have it complete, like I don't have the packaging, um, or if somebody just had any kind of little item like that that I don't have. Um, the library would love to acquire it um, for the collection so we can make it the most complete as possible. It's almost like a museum. And I was about to say, to yeah. A museum within a library. Um, so that's a great thing about it. And I hope that someday some collectors might be willing to do that just to make it more complete and so that fans can get a better variety of everything when they go see it. So that's my big hope is, yeah. is that it'll, it'll be made more complete either through other collectors or myself eventually. 
That is so amazing. And to me, the public library is such a special place The honestly, I mean, I originally learned about um, Nancy Drew through my mom. My mom gave me her books and then I started reading them. It's kind of a common story, right? But honestly, it was really my local public library that kind of inculcated in me kind of a greater love of Nancy Drew and mystery in general, Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I had my mom's book, but once I read all those, the library is where I went and where I read all the rest. That's where I got introduced to the Nancy Drew, uh, her interactive PC games. I played those. And that's honestly probably what really carried me (laughs) throughout my life in the Nancy Drew fandom. Um, and so it's just such a special, a special thing to get to. I I, like what I would not give to be a child to get to go to the Toledo library and be able to experience all that Nancy Drew history and get to pick Nancy Drew's off the shelf. That's just, that's so cool. Um, okay. So you meant, you talked a little bit about this, but, um, is there anything like super specific for you that you want to mention that you are looking for, that you want to send a call out to everybody that you're looking for this oh, one like thing? for the collect for the yeah. library? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned the canister, the puzzle and the canister, definitely that, uh, that seventies t-shirt that someone had way back, but doesn't have any more. So we know it exists. Hmm. Um, the watch and all the original packaging. Um, well, now Jem found those Nesquik uh, labels. I don't know if you guys mm. saw that on Book Fans, but I did. Jim discovered like it was an eBay auction, and he bought it with a Buy It Now, and so he acquired the. There was like four labels. He's sending me one of the labels. I'm so Aww. excited. <laughs> that was so sweet of him. Um, he ended up with four labels, and three were duplicates of each other. Um, and so there's the chocolate version uh, that would go on the chocolate Nesquik container. And then um, that I don't have. And then actually having a container with the label on it, like a vintage from the, you know, because that was back in the 70s. I think it was 70s. Yeah. So um, just having that, I mean, that was something I didn't even know about. I guess some Hardy Boys fans might have known about it, um, but I don't really collect Hardy Boys per se. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a lot of background on them specifically unless it relates to nancy drew in some way or it's just something i've learned and i'd never heard of that um but it, yeah they advertise nancy drew and hardy boys books on the back of the wow. or part of the label that you could send off for and so that was a cool find so i'm going to get the strawberry version of the label so i'm so excited <laughs> to have that and of course eventually it will end up in toledo i'm going to enjoy it here for a while because that's just something it's probably really scarce these labels were never used And the seller was selling a lot of other like label and ephemera related items to Nesquik and that company. Um, So we're thinking maybe it was somebody that Mm. kept them that worked there at the factory or worked for the company that had a stash of all this stuff. And then somebody got it to sell. Maybe they passed on sadly or, you know, something like that. So anyhow, there's little fun things that I don't even know about that come up um, like that. But, um, you know, there's, of course, original artwork that I don't have. Like if somebody had um, some other nappies or any of the other modern, you know, art or some of the cameo art editions, anything like that would be fun for their, not only my collection, but they also collect all that original children's art. They have a gallery of that. So it's kind of in that vein, I guess, just anything that's really scarce. I have a Pinterest board or a Pinterest page with a bunch of boards. Um, and you could send everybody there. They can look, it's all by categories, like book club related things, you know, book related collectibles, movie collectibles, TV show. It's all on these different boards. And I actually have a board there too. That's like the missing collectibles or things I don't have that I missed out on. So if there's, if you go to that board, you can see, you know, what I don't have that I would love to have in the collection. So if you have anything on that board and want to donate it to the library, you know, that would be great. And Cool. If anybody has anything to donate, they can just contact me and I can get them in touch with the right person at the library and perfect facilitate that happening. Yeah. Okay. So what would you say is your favorite thing in your collection? That's another hard one. You got a lot. <laughs> um, I think probably my most, yeah, my most favorite is probably my secret of the old clock. The book itself, I just had the book without the dust jacket originally. And I took that with me when I met Millie originally. Oh. And she signed it for me in person. And so that's probably my favorite item just because. Of course. And then, you know, I upgraded because I actually got the book with the original dust jacket and switched them out because um, it was a matching. It didn't matter because it was the same match set. 
Um, and then I have, I had a reproduction dust jacket that a collector friend who had, who started the Nancy Drew Sleuths with me, the, the original group, discussion group, she made a copy of her original. She had the, actually had the book with the dust jacket. And so that reproduction dust jacket and that blank and paper book um, are in Toledo. Um, so there is a first printing with a repro in the collection there. Wow. But here at home, I have the original with, you know, so that's special. And then probably my Rudy Nappy hidden staircase painting is pretty cool because I I always love that book. So that's kind of special to me. It's just so iconic too. Yeah. The most iconic Nancy Drew cover with the her on the flashlight. It really is. It's that and old clock are probably two and maybe old attic are two really iconic cover or three iconic covers. Um, but yeah, that's the one I grew up with. That's the version I read, the art that was on my book. Uh, growing up and then I fell in love with so it just kind of was so amazing that he still had that painting when I asked him um about what he had left when I got in touch with him so I was very lucky yeah that's amazing Mm -hmm. so as a you know a collector guru what advice would you give to people just starting to build their collection what should they look for what should they do Yeah, that's a good question because I kind of think back to when I started out and I think like one of the easiest things you can do because there's so much to collect, it can just get absolutely overwhelming with, especially if you tried to do what I do, which is get everything you possibly can (laughs) and find all this ephemera and historical, it gets insane. So my suggestion is, is if you don't have your childhood books then just start fresh, if you have some fill in the gaps and just collect what you are initially attracted to. So if you grew up with the yellow spines and you don't have a complete set, work on completing the set and start that way. And then if you want to branch back to vintage, you know, and try to get the books with the dust jackets, then start on that. And then if you were kind of in the modern era and you have a lot of paperbacks, fill in those if those are what is more interesting to you. So focus on what you probably maybe based on nostalgia as a kid. Um, what you most are interested in and then branch from there as you get into it, because then some people just go down that rabbit hole like I did where you got to get everything. And it was just like, that was my thing. I didn't have it all. And, um, which is a little insane when you think about it, um, the prospect (laughs) of doing that. But I did this over like 20 years when I donated, which is kind of crazy too, uh, to think about how long I've been collecting. Um, you know, have patience because, eBay is not quite what it used to be. It doesn't have the plethora of vintage stuff and the ephemera that it used to have. So I probably got in there during the heyday, which really helped Mm. because most of my collection came from, from eBay other than what I had originally. Cause you can't really find a lot of the variety locally. Most people can't. So I would say be patient, um, be willing to buy online. It's like, like eBay, Etsy has stuff too. There's other places, but Um, Some of our collectors in the group, they don't really like buying online. They want to see it in person, but you can't really collect the variety in person generally. So if you want to get into more things that you can find locally, you've got to find a way to get yourself online and just do it. Um, If you're somebody that never read these books growing up and you just discovered Nancy Drew as you got older, maybe through the games or some other way, um, then I would just suggest maybe start with the classics because I think those are the best and just start and read a couple of them. See if you like them, see if you like that particular part of the Nancy Drew world and then start in, you know, and if you don't care for them, they're too vintage for you for some reason. I, how could anything be too vintage? But <laughs> some people just love the modern stuff, you know? So if you really like modern Nancy Drew, then just start there and just kind of branch out. You know, some for some people, it's a budget issue. For me, for most of my collecting, it was a budget issue. Like I couldn't just. There were things I missed out on on eBay a lot because there were some collectors that could afford, which is fine. Um, you know, something in it and it would drive the price up, and then somebody would get it for, and I couldn't compete with that. You know, I was going through law school and you know, paying for that and, and other issues, being married young and, and having a house and all that we set up. And I just had a lot going on. So I couldn't afford um, to spend a lot on my collection. So I would try to find the deals, you could say. Like I found a first printing of, of Haunted Bridge. It's now in Toledo. I believe I sent that one off. 
It's like $27 at eBay. Wow. I don't know how I did. <laughs> I don't know why anybody else didn't bid that particular day, but I managed to get a score on that one. No. So I would try to get things like, you know, inexpensively as much as I could. And then over time I could afford to collect more. So if you can't afford to collect the big things or the expensive things, just start out with the things that make you happy that are more budget friendly. A lot of sellers list stuff on eBay for buy it now prices now instead of just auctions like it was in the very beginning. Um, and sometimes a seller will list something really good for $20 or something, you know, way under what it would normally would sell if it was at auction. Um, so that's, I check the buy it nows frequently and see what's being listed and jump on like Jim, he jumped on those labels. Um, that was a good deal. They would have probably sold three to four times higher if they'd been on an auction. I think some of us collectors would have all gone, you know, <laughs> jumped on it. And so you would have seen a lot higher price. So you can find some really good deals, uh, to buy it nows. So that's what I would suggest to people. Wow. Yeah, no, I was just talking, uh, we, we did a little, um, we do kind of like a mini version, uh, like we call them our scoop sessions, uh, mini talks uh, for our podcast that we released just on our Patreon. And we were just going through our collections um, and what mm -hmm. it is that we have. And honestly, I think probably some of my favorites are, um, I have a box set of the Nancy Drew Diaries. And just because, not because they're, you know, they're not old or anything like that, but they're mm -hmm. just so beautiful to me. I think the artwork on mm -hmm. them is just so, so gorgeous. And so like reminiscent and classic of like the flashlight editions that is just, I just thought that was just so great. Plus my, my husband got them for me. It was a gift. So it was like, you know, it's extra oh, that's special. Sweet. Yeah. You know? That was yeah. extra special. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just the thing is like, whatever really, what you're drawn to is what you should, because collecting can, not that it's drudgery at times, but there can be some times where you're just like, eh, I don't know about this, <laughs> or you get tired of collecting a certain thing. It's just not that interesting to you. But when it's really interesting to you is when it drives you to seek it out and hunt for it, mm -hmm. like relentlessly yeah. until you get it or get it all if there's more than one. But I think that's the most important part of collecting is something that's really interesting. Thrill of the chase. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I wish I could find more locally. Um, I don't go on the hunt as much as I used to. Um, I think the pandemic sort of slowed that down because nobody was going to do anything like that. Everything was closed. Right. Um, and now that it's back open, you know, for a while, it's just like, I've, I've had a few adventures at bookstores, but I guess most of the time I go to a bookstore, it's like stuff that I already have. Right. Um, you know, a lot of it's not these rare, scarcer mm -hmm. items or additions. And it's still fun to go and look and see if there's anything, but it, it's, it's just made it easier to go on a site like eBay and then really something pops up. It was funny because before Jim got those labels, I was telling him like two days before that I had just said, you know, it's just this, the, this, the variety of stuff on eBay is just boring right now. <laughs> and then that popped up and of course I missed it, but I'm so, so glad he saw it and got it. So I can't wait to get that label in and display it. It's going to be fun. That was very cool. Let's see. So, yeah. So we, you talked a little bit about your consulting. Um, we know that you consulted on the 2007 Emma Roberts movie and the development of the soon to be action figures. What's been your favorite thing to consult on? Or do you have any like fun stories of like silly questions people ask you about Nancy Drew? <laughs> So, uh, so there's so many fun things. I would say the movie was a huge highlight yeah. for me because, you know, I'd, I've never been involved in anything related to movies before, Hollywood, etc. So that was very fun just to get that opportunity. And I just mainly worked with the director as he was, the script had been written by another person and he was going through it and kind of rewriting parts and revising things and this and that. And he wanted somebody that knew the classic books because those were what he was a fan of, um, that he could ask questions about or, you know, George shouldn't be Georgina. I think they were calling her Georgina in the script oh, no. originally. And I was like, no, 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 you can't call it it's George. <laughs> Anyhow, I fixed that problem, but there were other things I couldn't fix. Um, so the movie wasn't perfect. It was cute. Um, but I mainly worked with him on that. And then I got to go to the, you know, to the studio at Warner Brothers when they were filming on the soundstage. 
and doing some of the scenes in there, like the secret passageway and different things like that. So I got to spend two or three days out on the movie set, just observing them. And it was amazing how many hours it would take to film like three lines, (laughs) just (laughs) different angles and redos. And you were like, wow, this is really tedious. Um, you don't realize how tedious it can be, but I got to meet the costume director and he showed me this binder of all the stuff, the the photos they had taken for different costumes in the film. And I got to meet Emma Roberts. Um, she was curious why I was walking around because I was taking notes for an article. I was going to write about (laughs) my experience. She was curious about what I was doing and, you know, that was, and meet their stunt double. I, I saw their stunt doubles, like the little quirky kid, yes. <laughs> the little short guy. He had an interesting stunt double who was not a kid. He was just very short right. um, <laughs> for some of the stunts. And it was so fun just to see the stunt part. Um, but that was so cool. Just getting that behind the scenes of the movie set. And my mom got to go with me. Oh, we drove wow. out there. So we had fun. Um, but the action figures actually has been super cool. And one of my, probably one of my favorites too. Just the guys behind that and Wandering Planet, Doc and Gavin are so cool. Um, and they just obviously love their action figures. I mean, they've collected them for years. Um, so it's a big thing for them. And getting to start their own company where they're making yeah. figures, you know, for different things. So Nancy Drew never had an action figure. And now she will. And they've done such a great job. They have. Just bringing her to life off the covers. Everything looks so good. The packaging is phenomenal. You guys are going to love the packaging. And I got to write some of the the card copy for that, um, for the back, like where it talks about what happens in the mystery the figure is based on. So I got to be involved like that and, you know, help with like an outline or some intro part to what a novella would be, uh, was written by a ghostwriter, Simon Schuster provided. And I got to read the novella. I read it. It's really good. I like it. It's very classic style. Nancy It's very good. People are going to love it. And then getting Ruth on board. Um, you guys met Ruth at the Mm -hmm. convention, um, last fall. Ruth Sanderson was so cool about doing the cover for this novella. And I thought she did a great job of bringing classic Nancy to life on that. So yeah, the whole process has been really cool. I was so excited when it got funded through Kickstarter. I kind of placed I placed an order too just to help bump it over <laughs> no. what it needed. And so I'm getting some extras that I'll probably send to Toledo for the collection at the library. Perfect. And yeah. um yeah, that was so cool just to see the campaign how it ended and how the fans being so excited about them. Um so I hope all the fans, you know, that wanted action figures got in on that. But I think there'll be some available probably uh, at some point. I know they want to try to get them into some retail arenas. Cool. Um, so hopefully that'll happen. And hopefully we'll have a second wave at some point of more action figures. So, yeah, that was so much fun. That's so cool. Have you gotten to consult any on the musical that yeah. they're working on currently? Oh, the Broadway show. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've been in touch with the... Uh, uh, the head guy, his name is Beckett. Um, he has a great Australian accent. Um, (laughs) he's fun. He's been so much fun. I mean, just to hear about like the stuff that's gone on. I went to a reading actually, was it 2018? I think it was. Yeah. Uh, fall of 2018. They did, they had an original script for it. It's been scrapped. Mm -hmm. It's all being redone, which is a good thing, (laughs) but they had a reading. (laughs) Yeah. The original didn't seem... (laughs) It was a little strange, the mm-hmm. whole concept to me. I mean, it, some of it was okay and some of it was weird. Uh, even, and Beckett would agree. But um, I can't say much about what's going on now. But but originally there was a reading um, in New York, and I got to go to that. And another collector friend that lives in the New York area, I invited her to go with me. So we went and saw the reading of everything. And they had some actors and people there for the reading. And it was it was neat to see that side of it and how they go through the process. And so... Now it's been totally revamped, a different concept, which I think is fantastic. It's going to do really well, I think. And they've got so many neat people involved, um, you know, with the with the new one. So I think it's going to be really good. I haven't heard much lately in the last six, seven months. So okay. I don't know where they're at. I don't know where it's going, but... That's so cool. Yeah, we are very excited about the prospect of a musical, and we have been following it ever since. Yeah, we, we heard about... Uh, all the stuff back there we found the the songs on youtube you know that they posted for that oh they were like yeah was it like nancy freaking drew or something yes. and i was like nancy oh come Freakin on drew. that's not yeah um which Ugh. were cheesy yeah, and stuff. very interesting to, to 
much. Um, but the concept, you know, of a, of a show, of a Broadway show in general is very exciting to me personally. Oh yeah. And there's <laughs> so much they can do with that. I mean, I know they're going to do merchandising. The merchandising oh. for it is probably going to be so oh. cool. Um, yeah, I, I think they were originally talking about possibly debuting it this year Mm -hmm. but i don't know that that's gonna happen yet so i'm i'm guessing i mean it would make sense for them to debut it next year for the anniversary because of all the publicity that should be going on for that might be a better way to do it but i don't know so i guess we'll stay tuned Mm -hmm. very exciting Mm -hmm. um Okay, we do have kind of just a, a fun, a question just for funsies. Um, and that is, that are you a Nancy or are you a Bess or are you a George? I would say mostly a Nancy, but I have a sweet tooth like Bess. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I can be very, I'm mostly nice. I just am. I've always been that way. But sometimes I can have a blunt zinger like George. Mm-hmm. So I've got a little bit of George in me, a little bit of Bess. And my curiosity and wanting to get to the bottom of things, definitely Nancy. So I was gonna say, with a law degree, I mean, that's <laughs> I mean, you can't really get much more Nancy than Drat. Now maybe you're a Carson. Maybe you're yeah. Yeah, maybe a little Carson <laughs> thrown in. And a little Hannah Gruen, because I like to cook and bake. Oh my god. So, yeah. there, there you go. go. Everybody. <laughs> Everyone's Great represented answer. in yeah. the whole field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we did actually, um, on our Instagram, we put out a call to our followers to ask them what they wanted to know about you or um, about Nancy. Okay. So um, here's the first one. Um, what would you say are some telltale signs that you have a really early edition of Nancy Drew versus a newer edition? Okay. So if you have a paperback, it's definitely no. That's clue number one. If you have a yellow spine book, that, that those started in the 60s, so it's 60s on. If it's a flashlight edition, the glossy yellow with a flashlight banner across the top, those came out in the mid-80s, and they're still in, being published that way. If it's blue, it depends on what the book looks like. And they definitely want to go to my website, nancydrewsleuth.com, because you can look at all the formats over the years and see what your books look like at different decades. But if it's blank and blue and blank, there's no silhouette on it. It's the original format from 1930 to 1932. Only the first seven books came that way. 32, they started with the orange silhouette on the blue. And that ran for a while. And then eventually in the 40s, we had the blue version of that for like a one print run. And then um, then it was the um, just sort of a revised 40 silhouette where they changed the silhouette and then it became the tweed books. So that kind of there's a progression. But if you have a book that has lists inside, not like on the copyright page, but like a pretext listing of all the different Nancy Drews and usually Dana girls, sometimes in the back of the book, there were pages of ads. The very last listed Nancy Drew book, find out when that was first published. And that's will give you a circa this year. So if it was published in, if you have Old Clock and it lists to, you know, Secret of the Wooden Lady that came out in 50. So you know your book is around a 1950 printing. If it has a dust jacket, the flaps of the dust jacket would list different series. So most of the time Nancy was on the front flap, not always, but the last listed Nancy on the dust jacket also will clue you in to, it'll help narrow it down um, for sure. And then you can kind of figure out what era your book is from because the copyright dates they never changed right you know until a book was revised so yeah yeah. so that's kind of a red herring a lot of people see that don't know or that aren't collectors they just pick up an old book and they see the copyright and they think it's from that year but it's not in Nancy Mm -hmm. Drew's case it's not so that's such a good tip I didn't even think Mm -hmm. about that yeah yeah yeah. that's that's a good way because like you know back when I was first starting to try to gather books I was trying to figure out when my books were from exactly and the ones that I had been starting to collect. And so I would go in and look at the lists and be like, okay. And I have these old sticky notes I put in my books that I had at the time. I'd be like circa 1979 printing or circa whatever printing, you know, where I was kind of figuring it out based on the list, just on my own. So, yeah. Another question that our listeners have for you is what do you think are the most desirable additions to own? The most desirable probably would be the vintage ones from the 30s, um, the original, um, because they're the most vintage for people wanting the most vintage. Or you could go first 34 original Mm texts, the original versions before they revise them might be special to collect. Um, You know, it could be subjective depending on what people are interested in. But I'd say 
most collectors seek out those originals and first printings of them. And that original format of the first seven books, certainly very desirable. Um, I was finally able to acquire all of those over the past year, thanks to another collector who was downsizing. I never thought I would own all of those. Like I really never thought I would. So that was just a really nice opportunity and it'll really enhance the collection in Toledo someday when I eventually they get to Toledo. Wow. It's so impressive how you know all the different editions just off the top of your head. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I talk about it so much over all these years. <laughs> it just becomes like breathing, I guess, yeah. you know, but, and there's, there's some eras, areas of Nancy Drew. I'm not as, you know, smarty about some of the modern stuff. I have to stop and think a second for some of the stuff because, <laughs> you know, I'm not hyper-focused on that as much, but Yeah. And of course, as you just said, your website has all of this information. So listeners, if you ever want to try to identify when your book was published or, um, you know, what your ephemera is all about, definitely go check out Jen's website because it is the most complete thing you could ever imagine. It's got so much amazing information there. I'm pretty sure I reference it about once an episode for us. Just yeah, to look I spend a lot of time sure here myself. <laughs> I know what I have and, you know, like what, who's the ghostwriter for this one? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. I'm glad you guys really find it useful. I find that it seems like a lot of times these days, people don't check out the websites as much, you know, they'll just mm-hmm. go onto Facebook right. or somewhere like that to search for info. But yeah, I mean, that was a labor of love. I, I put it together myself. You guys it's vintagey looking just rudimentary because I did my own HTML wow. back in the day when that was a thing. Yeah. yeah I'm in, in the process of revamping the website. It's oh, not cool. published up there, but I'm making it a little bit more easy, maybe user friendly. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so it, but it does, it has so much information on there for anybody just starting out just to see what they have, just going to the format section and the collecting section, you can get all kinds of tips. Absolutely. Um, the next question that we have here, someone wants to know how they can go about joining the Sleuth fan club. You can go to nancydrewfans.com and we have a section on the membership they can click on. And then you can buy the membership kit. And we recently redid it. It used to come with a tote bag. Now it's coming it comes with one of our little pouches. It's got images of Nancy and quotes on it. Oh, um, cute. Yeah. And then the membership card and a little greeting thing about the group and where you can find us online and all that little information for membership. And it's a lifetime membership, so you don't have to oh, pay yearly. Okay. You just join once. All right. So our next question, you kind of already have touched on a little bit, so I'm going to modify it a little bit. So sorry to okay. whoever asked this question, but the original question was, what is the most expensive item to collect? And you kind of talked about what the rarer ones were. So those are probably going to be more expensive, but maybe what is the most expensive item um, that you think exists? <laughs> I would say like the first printing of old clock has been one of the most expensive items I've seen Mm. as far as the books go. Um, I've seen it not in recent years, but back in the day when I was first starting, it was selling for over 10,000 at auction with the original (gasps) dust jacket. Wow. In fact, somebody on the group, our old discussion group found like a buy it now. Somebody listed an old clock in it with the original. It was the first printing with the original dust jacket for a hundred dollar buy it now. (laughs) Of course, I, I think I was away at a convention, so I wasn't paying attention. I missed oh. that. Oh, my God. Oh. I would have that for $100. <laughs> and she she listed it on eBay to help pay for her college, oh. which was good. You know, that was great. Uh, and it ended up selling off of eBay for an undisclosed amount, probably more than 10000 But we don't know. We don't know who bought it. We don't know anything. Um, but, yeah, that was interesting. Wow. And then um, – non-book related the art the original tandy art mm, of course um it publicly it was disclosed it was over like around thirty five thousand uh for the secret in the old attic tandy painting wow. that sold several years ago so that is really high end mm-hmm. that tandy yeah. art um it's going to be your high end part of collecting for the books i would say old clock and some of those earlier first printings in that original format are going to be the ones that sell really high wow. Well, yeah. congratulations to that girl who got her college paid for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. She, yeah, she, that would have helped so much. And that was back in the early 2000s. I mean, college is a lot more expensive than it was back then. Um, but yeah, it definitely would have made a nice yes. dent in oh, college surely. education. So that, that's, that was a good cause. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we've got another fun one here. What would you say are your top three favorite Nancys? 
Top three. Well, Hidden Staircase and Old Attic would definitely be in the top two. If I had to add a third one, that's interesting. Well, I always loved the witch tree symbol because it was sort of, you know, that whole kind of theme. But I don't know. Because um, I'm thinking about, well, I mean, I loved doing the Mirror Bay one last year at that convention. And the research behind it made it so much more interesting to me. Um, old clock is definitely up there. It's not as exciting to me in some ways as staircase. It didn't have the spooky old house, but yeah. there was a lot of action and adventure. Um, so I would say like old clock staircase, old attic and which tree are kind of up there and maybe throw something in like haunted show Woat or Blackwood hall, because I love the visits to new Orleans and those books. So that was kind of fun. Nice. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jen, can you tell our listeners where they can find more information about you online or how they can contact you if they would like to? Sure. So nancydrewsleuth.com is my main Nancy Drew website about collecting in the books and the history. And then you can go to nancydrewfans.com to find all of the stuff about our group, conventions, our zine, the sleuth, join the membership. We have merchandise there. And then on social media, you know, I'm, we're at Twitter, we're at Instagram, we're on Pinterest, we're on Facebook. And so you can find all those links off of those websites. Okay. Um, my handles on most of those platforms are at Nancy Drew Expert, um, or we're Nancy Drew fans or Nancy Drew Sleuths, but we have links off all the main websites. Okay. And then you can always contact me email wise, um, the easiest one to spell out right now is, is Nancy Drew Sleuth, not just singular sleuth at AOL.com is my main website email. And then my other email is you can link it off Nancy Drew fans. Okay. Awesome. Um, before we let you go, is there anything else that you want our listeners to know? You know, that's a good question. There's so much <laughs> I could talk about. <laughs> Please continue. Um, you guys, you guys, you guys got to have me back on about, um, about Mildred Benson okay, and the history yes. behind all that. That would be fun. Um, I, I guess, um, I think just, I'll just say this, that, you know, we're all Nancy Drew fans. We love Nancy Drew and, and what attracts us to Nancy Drew. Most of us, I think is her bold and intelligence, her boldness, her daring, her adventure, her zest to solve mysteries and right wrongs and save the day. And she's that great role model. And I think those are all amazing, wonderful things. And so I would like for people to continue that legacy that's been around so many years. We're almost to 95 years uh, by passing these books down to family and friends and sharing them, sharing them with a neighborhood kid, um, donating books to your library if you don't want them anymore, finding places for your collection, setting up displays of your collections um, at your local library just temporarily for people to learn more about it. You know, go out there and just share the Nancy Drew fun and adventure with other people because it's something that inspired all of us. And I think being that role model is what's so nice. I mean, most of us, don't even think about it. I mean, people talk about me being a role model in the Nancy Drew community. And I don't necessarily, I guess I see myself as that way now. I didn't see that so much until people pointed that out. And I thought about it a little bit, but um, everybody, it doesn't matter if you have a small collection or you've been collecting for a few days. I mean, everybody's a role model to somebody. You just may not realize it. And so Think about that little thing, you know, as you go forth in your life and what you do and how you choose to live your life and, and that you're a role model to somebody. And so, you know, be more like Nancy, be, be positive, be inquisitive, right wrongs, help others when you can, and just be a good all around person for other people. And those are qualities that we, you know, in, have been inspired from Nancy to have in our lives. So that's a good thing. Also oh, well Joking. said. That's, yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's so kind of the whole yeah. point of Nancy, right? To to embody yeah, those qualities definitely. and pass it down to the next generation. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I love that. Definitely. <laughs> well, we would definitely love to have you on again yes. sometime if you're up for oh, it. I would love it. It was so much fun. Yeah, so this fun. Is so easy to chat with. You guys are easy to chat with, oh, okay. so it's cool. Oh, thank I'm glad you. to hear that. I'm glad. <laughs> glad. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jen. I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up the recording here then. <laughs> that was so wonderful. <laughs> yes, I'm so, so glad we got to have Jen on. She is a true pleasure to talk to, but it was also just so great to get to listen to her, listen to her story and kind of understand more about her Nancy Drew journey and 
um, you know, how we got here to where we all are today. Thanks to her. Um, so yeah, it was just such a pleasure to get to talk to her. Um, and especially we, you know, we wanted to have an interview with Jen, um, because we really, we've been talking a lot about, you know, collecting. And I know that a whole lot of our fan base, um, and a lot of the Nancy Drew fans in general are big into collecting. And it was something that we've never really touched on a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was definitely something that I think we've been needing to cover. So I'm glad, I'm glad that we got Jen on. Definitely yeah. felt like a long time coming. I'm just so in <laughs> awe of her massive amount of knowledge of Nancy Drew that, I mean, mm -hmm. we were we really wanted to talk to her eventually anyway, but what better timing than when we're getting ready to talk about Nancy Drew collections and kind of the history of, of those editions. Oh, that's right, Corey, because that's our next mm. episode, isn't it? Huh, how strange. <laughs> how strange. Uh, um, yeah, so next up, we're actually going to cover a lot of Nancy Drew history on the history of the Nancy Drew illustrators. Yes, I'm so excited <laughs> for this one. Yeah, um, and so hopefully uh, Jen's interview dovetails nicely um, into that. This episode's actually, we're going to release it a little bit out of our normal schedule. Um, we're actually going to release it just next next week. So not you don't have to wait two weeks for this episode, just one. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we've been working on it for quite a little while here. So I'm excited to see it all kind of, you know, as one whole piece now, because I feel like I've been piecing together this information for a long time. And I'm excited to just like have it all in order. Yeah. Yes. And we're very excited to get to share that with you. Um, so I guess join us next week. Yeah. For that episode on the history of Nancy Drew Illustrators. Yeah. We'll see y'all then. And we'll see you then, regular Drews. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you like this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at Regular Nancy Drew and Twitter at Regular ND. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $3 level vote on upcoming episode topics and get exclusive access to our Scoop Sesh series. And all patrons receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, Thanks for listening. listening.